1880s, the most prominent figure in the London theatre was the writer John Lilly. John Lilly was the best-selling writer of the Elizabethan period, the period we now think of as Shakespeare's time. And so the first of his literary activities we know about is a prose text, um, kind of a, a predecessor of the novel um, in some ways, um, called Euphues, um, which is published in 1578 and is an absolute sensation. Lilly's two prose fictions become the best-selling works of the period and he seems to have then been headhunted by the Earl of Oxford to front a group of boy actors who perform plays in London in the Blackfriars Theatre and later at St Paul's. And these plays also went on to Elizabeth I's court. Now Oxford um, is ambitious but is also of um, uncertain temperament. And at the point when he and Lily seem to come together, Oxford has been banished from Elizabeth's court. Um, he's banished in 1580, doesn't make a return until 1583. And when he does, his reappearance at court coincides with the performance of two plays by Lily at court, um, Campaspe and Sappho and Feo, in 1583 and 1584. I would either your cunning, Feo, or your fortune might by simples provoke my lady to some slumber. My simples are in operation as is my simplicity, which if they can do little good, assuredly they can do no harm. If I were sick, the very sight of thy fair face would drive me into a sound sleep. Well, let us in. Feo is here. Oh. Feo. The hardest thing for a modern audience to get their head around in relation to the boy companies is that the boy companies were the most elite form of performers. We think now of children's performance as the thing you see at school, and with apologies to any mums and dads we're offending here, uh, we don't often tend to treat that as the, as the elite form of performance. Whereas for the Tudors, it's the boys who go to the court to sing and then to perform for the monarch. So these are the highest status form of performers, and it picks up in Elizabeth's period as we suddenly get these new uh, purpose-built theatrical spaces opening up in London. So a stage and an auditorium built, in this case um, indoors, in the Blackfriars space and in St Paul's. A theatre in the Blackfriars is established um, in the late 1570s, so in the winter of 1576-77, um, around the time when the amphitheatres are also being established in other parts of London. Um, so there's a move to kind of institutionalise the theatre in some ways. And Richard Farrant leases premises in the Blackfriars, so in old monastery land, and initially says that he wants to use this for training these boys to, to perform. But he starts to put on semi-public performances as well, so which people can pay. So Oxford gets the lease on this converted set of rooms um, in the early 1580s and seems to bring Lily in um, as the kind of main playwright. Best your ladyship if you give me leave to be gone. For I can but sigh. Nay, stay. For now I begin to sigh, I shall not leave, though you be gone. But what do you think best for your sighing to take it away? You, madam. Me? No, madam, you of the tree. <laughs> then will I love only you. Lily's writing at a time in which these early theatres are just beginning and people are still trying to discover the kinds of stories that will fascinate audiences. And what sets Lily apart from what's happening around him is his turning to Greek stories in particular. So he begins by writing about Alexander the Great, um, about Galatea, um, about Sappho, who in Greek myth or Greek legend is a poet. Lily makes her more of a, a virginal queen. Sappho. I have heard thy complaints and pitied thine agonies. Oh, Venus, my cares are only known to thee, and by thee only came the cause. Cupid, why didst thou wound me so deep? My mother bade me draw my arrow to the head. Sappho and Feo is probably Lily's second play, so after Campaspe. Um, and both of these plays are comedies. Both of them were performed at court um, in 1583 and 1584, respectively. And they do seem to be written with an eye to court. In some ways, they're both about rulers, and they're both about rulers being assaulted by love, which is very interesting in the context of Elizabeth I, um, the fact that, obviously, in the 1580s, she was still unmarried. And the early 1580s is, in some ways, the, at the point when people are beginning to think, well, actually, she's never 
this is not going to happen, she's not going to get married. Lily is adapting a story from Ovid in which uh, Sappho writes a love letter complaining about her love affair for Feo. And Sappho in this, in this poem is suicidal, miserable, and has obviously had a very exciting sex life in the past. Lily does some very odd things to that, turning Sappho into a virginal queen. There's no sense of her being a queen in, in the Ovidian source and turning Feo into a fairy boy who gets picked up by Sappho, quite literally in this case, and turned into a courtier. In this version, Sappho in the end conquers love and she kidnaps Cupid from Venus. And so at the end of the play, um, Feo is forsaken and Sappho is now in charge of Cupid and Cupid's arrows. Venus, why didst thou prove so hateful? Cupid took a wrong shaft. Oh, Cupid. Too unkind to make me so kind that I almost transgressed the modesty of my kind. I was blind and could not see mine arrow. Be not dismayed. Feo shall yield. If you imagine yourself sitting watching Sappho and Feo at the Elizabethan court, your seat, your placement within the audience is determined entirely by your rank and your relationship with the Queen, who will be sat just a few chairs away from you and you're watching a play about someone who is being forced into the court and forced out from the court against his own will. And so you're watching a play which plots out the very things that have brought you to see the, to the court in the first place. And so Lily's already started to ask the court about the relationship between powerful figures and very powerless figures and what that tells you about sexuality. So we get lots of alliteration in Lily, lots of assonance in Lily, lots of kind of playing around with words that sound similar. And that idea of play is absolutely crucial. So Lily's dialogue, his language, is absolutely characterised by wit and by kind of playfulness. If he yield, then shall I shame to embrace one so mean? If not, die, because I cannot embrace one so mean. Thus do I find no mean. Yes, I don't, I don't think it's going too far to say that Lily's comedies are the most influential um, of the um, 16th century partly because of the influence they have on figures such as Shakespeare, but also Ben Jonson, also John Marston. So in terms of Shakespeare, there are some very direct connections between Lily's works and Shakespeare's works. And one of the really interesting things is that the point at which Shakespeare's company, the Chamberlain's Men, really start investing in romantic comedy seems to be the point at which the children's companies are shut down. I think it's very, um, very valid to see Shakespeare's romantic comedies of the 1590s and particularly things like Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, coming out of this very strong Lillian influence and using it very self-consciously. Lily's influence is also felt at a much more material level in that he invents the idea of printing your plays for people to read. And here we have this notion of the DVD of the rock concert that you missed. People, again, were hoovering up this material. He's the first playwright to do this, but he also becomes the first and one of the very few playwrights whose plays seem to sell out and require reprints. And this is where the market for printed plays comes from. People simply weren't publishing their plays before Lily does this. And immediately after Lily's printing spree, which ends in 1592, we suddenly get this enormous market opening up from 1594 onwards for printed plays. If Shakespeare's plays hadn't been printed, we would have lost all of his work. We have a speech from Titus Andronicus, we have a very strange version of Henry IV, and that is it of Shakespeare's work. It all depends on this market which Lily creates. <laughs>